research. I get rid of that. Uh, often including aspects of their habitat use and conservation. His research strikes me as quite applied, certainly relative to mine, but I think also relative to most ecologists. He's worked on a variety of freshwater fish in North America, ranging from perch and sunfish to lake and green sturgeon. we will be talking about sturgeon today. And his research interests and approaches have been split between trophic ecology using stable isotopes and spatial ecology using super cool acoustic telemetry methods. Uh, he did his PhD at the University of Western Ontario, followed by professional appointments at a diversity of interesting institutions, including University of Windsor, Windsor Michigan State, and Shedd Aquarium. And now he's at UC Davis. I know Scott because he and I are both working on a project uh, based on telemetry data for Cal fish in California rivers and uh, highly fragmented California rivers. So uh, I will now turn it over for, to Scott. Thanks, Scott, for coming today. I look forward to seeing your talk. Thanks, Dan. I uh, appreciate everybody <clears throat> sitting through yet another Zoom meeting to, to end your week. I hope you find this, this interesting. Um, Dan is right that most of my work now does tend to focus on more applied questions with, uh, with um, freshwater fishes. But my background did originally start too with questions about ecological divergence and speciation. So even, even in the types of questions I've looked at over the years, it's quite diverse, but today is gonna to be a bit more of an applied talk about sturgeon. Um, I've been very fortunate over the past five-ish years, a little bit under five years to be working on lake sturgeon and, and now green sturgeon um, using uh, acoustic telemetry to inform the ecology and conservation of these, these fish in North America. Uh, the sturgeon family, for those of you who don't know, this is uh, a very diverse uh, group of species. Um, they're often called living fossils or the dinosaur fish, and par partially because of their appearance, especially when they're young and very armored. But the family does date back more than 250 million years. And in many aspects, they have retained features from that uh, period of, of their history. They are spread across marine and freshwater ecosystems around the world. They really are found almost everywhere you look when you, if you're looking close enough. But they can be quite mysterious because they do seem to disappear from our eyes for long periods of their life cycle. Uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, there were 27 living species. That's what's demonstrated by this figure here, this illustration. And unfortunately, uh, across the entire family, there are serious conservation concerns. So based on the IUCN status records for sturgeon, you can see that most of them are considered endangered at this point or vulnerable. The one, there's only four that are considered not threatened, but even then I have some asterisks because within specific populations of these four species, there are groups, there are populations considered endangered or threatened. And unfortunately, as of, I think it's a little bit under two years ago, the Chinese paddlefish was declared extinct in the wild. So we have, we're down to 26 sturgeon species uh, remaining. Uh, I've been fortunate to focus primarily on lake sturgeon and green sturgeon. Uh, they are two of the species by IUCN records that aren't, are considered not threatened as a species, but they both have populations considered threatened or endangered on more uh, regional specific levels. So here in the Great Lakes, there are some of the states have considered lake sturgeon populations endangered or threatened, so there are conservation efforts for them. And then green sturgeon, uh, for example, in California and the Sacramento River, that population is listed under the Endangered Species Act because that specific southern population is threatened. But these are the two species I've been working with, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about some aspects of my research with both of them today. Uh, when we start to think about conservation of sturgeon, why are there conservation concerns for these species? 
Uh, one is overfishing, both direct fishing efforts, so caviar, that delicacy of many different areas around the world. The most popular ones often come from sturgeon. There's an example here of white sturgeon caviar. There's also, because of their size, a prestige behind fishing for sturgeon. Um, just the, the effort to catch the largest fish around, and in many cases, sturgeon are the largest fish around. And in some areas, including in the Great Lakes, there was overfishing because sturgeon were considered a nuisance. They were getting in, tangled up in the lines for other fish of, of target. So people going out fishing and netting for things like walleye, the sturgeon were getting in their way. So there are unfortunately pictures from the late, late 1800s and early 1900s of just sturgeon stacked on the shoreline just to get them out of the way. So we've done a lot of overfishing for these animals. We've also have a long history of blocking passages along rivers. This is an example of a dam along the Sacramento River. And sturgeon life cycle typically, depend. they spend most of their lifetime for most species out in an open water area, whether it be the Great Lakes or the an ocean water body, but they depend on almost, not all, but the majority of sturgeon species depend on access to rivers for spawning. They travel up rivers to spawn and then the juveniles rear in the river and move down afterwards. We've done a really good job, good, at blocking passageways through river systems. Uh, another thing that we've done often in river systems uh, is cause habitat loss. This picture from the early 1900s, it's actually a section of the Detroit River that was blocked off and then dug out so that large freighters could pass through. So that is a shipping channel that was cut into the river. So yes, the river still flows through there, but all of the habitat that was there, foraging habitat, spawning habitat, huge sections of that can be taken out. And so habitat loss has been an issue for sturgeon. And Another one is invasive species. We've changed in so many regions, we've changed the, the dynamics of what species are present. Um, and sometimes it's in ways we wouldn't necessarily consider. I have a picture here of a little round goby, tiny fish, only about this big. And you're, you're probably thinking, how can that affect sturgeon? Well, sturgeon start their life small. The eggs and juveniles are vulnerable to invasive species, even some of these smaller ones that we could think are rather innocuous, but they could have a major impact. Um, and the brown goby are especially of interest because they are known to be able to be egg eaters and they're invasive through large areas of North America now. So how do we study sturgeon ecology? How do we learn about these fish? Well, fortunately, we can learn about them in the lab. The, in aquaculture settings, sturgeon act, many sturgeon actually do quite well. Um, so we can rear them in the lab, do, do controlled experiments, learn about them that way. It means we also have an avenue for aquaculture to keep the species alive. Uh, and then in the wild, we can also do things like netting of adults, go out using set lines or trap nets, um, also do egg sampling so we can put out egg mats at, at things and areas that we think they could be spawning and see if they actually are or not. So we can do a mixture of lab and field studies. With field studies in particular, um, a lot of questions about diet may be prominent. So stable isotopes or stomach contents are ways that we can learn about how lake sturgeon fit into the food web around them. Uh, tissue samples can also be used for things like genetic population structure. And there are people working on that. Uh, and there, I've seen a few interesting studies looking at population structure using um, dorsal spine clips from sturgeon. And then another thing that we're expanding on and I'm personally quite interested in it, are, is tracking. Once we collect uh, these large adults, we can make a fairly simple surgery, uh, insert a tag, and then track fish for a number of years, especially with sturgeon, you can put a tag in that will be active for a decade. 
And so we're getting long-term data sets about where and when fish are making movements, where sturgeon are going. And with that being my focus on acoustic telemetry, I wanted to take a minute just for those of you who may not know much about acoustic telemetry to introduce you to this method. This is a video produced by the European Tracking Network. And it, it's not about sturgeon specifically, but I think it's a good intro both to how acoustic telemetry works and some of the questions that we can ask using it. So I thought I'd let them do the talking for me for a minute. Aquatic ecosystems are full of life. Atlantic salmon migrate in and out of rivers to spawn. Sharks can move long distances in the ocean. Lobsters move around the ocean floor foraging. Eels migrate incredible distances to spawn at sea. Sunfish roam the wide ocean. Tunas can dive down to more than 1,000 meters. Understanding where, when and why animals move is necessary to adequately protect and manage them in a sustainable way. On land, we can use GPS to track animals, but that doesn't work in water. So how can scientists get this information when animals live underwater? One way to do that is using acoustic telemetry. Telemetry means to measure from a distance, and acoustic means using sounds. So scientists use acoustic telemetry to track animals from a distance using sounds. Once the study animals are caught, they undergo a small surgery so the scientists can implant acoustic transmitters. For larger fish like sharks and tunas, or for animals with a hard shell like lobsters, the acoustic transmitters are attached externally. These transmitters emit a sound through a sequence of pulses. The sequence is unique for each tag, so each animal has a unique ID. The IDs can be detected when the tagged animals swim close to receivers, as the receivers detect the sound emitted by the tag. Researchers have a network of thousands of receivers across Europe to track aquatic animals. The receiver information provides data on when and where animals move, but it can also assist scientists in understanding why they move, such as for spawning or feeding or even figure out where they are seeking refuge. The tagging research can help managers in decision-making processes, like where to create marine protected areas or MPAs to remove barriers for movements, like dam removals. In this way, acoustic telemetry is an important tool to inform the sustainable management and stewardship of aquatic animals by providing knowledge on their movements, habitat use and survival particularly in the face of changing global environments. So hopefully from that, you've got a bit of an idea of both how acoustic telemetry works and uh, what type of questions can be addressed using it for some reason. I don't know why it won't go, there we go. I want to go to the next slide for some reason. So um, in summary for acoustic telemetry, it is passive monitoring of tagged animals. And it can range from very small sizes. Um, smolts of many different fish species can be tagged up to very large sizes, sturgeon, sharks. Um, the key thing about these is the transmitters ping at set intervals. So for example, a transmitter may send out a sequence of sounds every 10 minutes. Uh, and then as long as you can have long-term tracking of fish, as long as they are passing within the detection range of a receiver. And that's the key, not limit restriction or key requirement of acoustic telemetry. There has to be a receiver to pick up that sound or it's unknown. There's no way for it to be recorded later and, and uh, assessed. So as long as there are enough receivers out, you can pick up where the fish are moving around. And hopefully you also saw from that video that the, there are many questions that can be asked and looked at using telemetry. It's not just a, a cookie cutter, one question can be asked and that's it. There's many different things. 
And hopefully with the Sturgeon examples I'm about to give you from my own research, you can see the variety of questions that can be asked. So I'm gonna start with some of my past research with lake sturgeon in the Great Lakes, where I've looked at variation in habitat use and survival of adult uh, lake sturgeon. I think most of us in North America are quite familiar with this picture of the Great Lakes. I'm uh, even now working for the University of California. I'm residing in Michigan, so I, I'm staying in the, the heart of the Great Lakes right now. And it's everywhere here, but I think it's across North America quite recognizable. What sometimes gets forgotten are the connections between the Great Lakes and how they're all interconnected with each other. And this red box that I've put up it's an area that often gets overlooked. It's the Huron Erie Corridor. It's connecting Lake Huron in the center of the picture to Lake Erie at the bottom. And it has two rivers, the St. Clair River and the Detroit River and a, a lake itself, Lake St. Clair in there. Um, if it wasn't surrounded by the Great Lakes, Lake St. Clair would look pretty impressive. It's unfortunately masked by the larger lakes around it, but it is still quite a water body all on its own. And this region of the Huron Erie Corridor is home to one of the uh, healthy populations left in the Great Lakes for Lake Sturgeon. Uh, it, it's actually probably the largest population left for Lake Sturgeon. Lake Sturgeon were once found throughout the Great Lakes Basin. They are now on state and provincial levels. Various populations are either extirpated, threatened, or endangered in most cases. Uh, in the Huron Erie Corridor though, they have remained fairly abundant. Uh, there was an estimate in 2012 of about 21,000 adults remaining in this corridor. Um, I've also seen estimates of 30 to 40,000 based on various methods. One of the characteristics of the Huron Erie Corridor is that it is largely barrier free. And by barrier free, I mean it's not, there aren't dams across the St. Clair or Detroit River. Uh, this is largely related to the level of shipping that happens through this area. So dams would not be practical. Uh, but that means that this entire region with the two lakes, that are two rivers and three lakes with Huron, St. Clair, and Erie there. It's all interconnected still. That's a lot of fresh water connected. Now, when people think of this area, they often think, especially when you hear Detroit River, it's, a, it's associated with urban and industrial activity. And this top picture is uh, downtown Detroit on the left side of the river, uh, Windsor, Ontario over on the right. And it's true that there are definitely segments of this area where we have developed right up to and engineered aspects of the waterways themselves. But there are also diverse habitat patches spread throughout this system. Uh, at the top, on the top picture, that's Detroit, and then the uh, Lake St. Clair is at the very top of that picture. If you kept heading straight across the river, you would end up to the site that's at the lower picture. And this is the St. Clair River Delta. And you can see there's some houses along here and things like that, but it's actually still really full of different habitat patches uh, for fish to use. And when the acoustic telemetry uh, tracking was brought to the Great Lakes a bit over 10 years ago, one of the first questions people began to ask about lake sturgeon is, well, where are they in this corridor? What, how are they making use of this habitat? And <clears throat> to answer that, receivers were positioned throughout the Huron Erie Corridor into Lake Huron and into Lake Erie. Uh, from 2011 to 2015, almost 300 lake sturgeon were tagged and released in this area um, from three sites, two in the St. Clair River, one in the Detroit River. And they were all tagged with transmitters that will last for a decade. So they're actually, we're actually still collecting data about these fish, most of these fish now. The tags are just starting to, to die out. And what's happening is we're able to monitor movements over long terms across seasons, years, and because of the number of receivers out here over quite far distances. And while I've been talking, most of you have probably been looking at the purple dots moving around here, which are those 283 tagged lake sturgeon. And what pops out right away is 
wow, they're real, they are moving all around this system. And it just looks like there are lake sturgeon everywhere. And it's true, lake sturgeon are active throughout the Huron Erie corridor. Uh, and then the question became, well, is there any sort of pattern, rhyme or reason to uh, how they're using habitat here? And we have found that there are multiple migratory behaviors organized into what we now argue are two populations based on the rivers. There tends to be a Detroit River population and a St. Clair River population that overlap a little bit around Lake St. Clair, but really they, they aren't moving much past uh, into, the, into both rivers. They tend to pick one river over the other and stay there for their lifetime or at least the tracking time that we've been doing. And we wanted to ask if migratory behaviors are linked to habitat patches that could be relevant to conservation planning. So we went even further beyond just, are, is there a Detroit River or St. Clair River population? Well, are there parts of, where, of the rivers and lakes that are um, used more so? And so this is where my research project came in with this group. Um, I looked at, uh, habitat segments. So we kept the lakes as the full water body just because of the number of receivers in most of the lakes. But the rivers, we divided them up, the two rivers into three segments each, which were based on physical and biological attributes. It wasn't a haphazard, we're going to put three segments in each river. It was for a variety of reasons. These rivers each have three fairly distinct zones to them. And so we have an upper, middle, and lower segment for each of the rivers. And then we looked at three years of data, of the tracking data from 2015 to 2017 through all three of those years. And we used a method called sequence analysis. Uh, and this was, can be considered, uh, it's often used in social science studies where they track the progression of people through their lifetime, for example. But we used the different locations that fish were to build a sequence. Uh, and in our case, we used their, the daily location of lake sturgeon in each of these nine detection areas. And so for every day of, those, of that three-year period, each, each of the tag sturgeon was assigned their location. And then we could look at the similarity of their distribution over time. So we assigned costs to score the sequence similarity. So it was a cost of zero if individuals were in the same location on a given day. So these two boxes that just popped up, Sturgeon one and three on December 31st, they were both in Lake St. Clair. So they were given a score of zero for that day. If they were in locations right next to each other, like Lake St. Clair and the upper Detroit River, or Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River Delta on that day, those two individuals were given a, a different score of one. They were close, but a little bit separate. And anything further apart, we gave a two. So an example of Lake St. Clair in the middle Detroit River. And what we were able to do by creating the, the sequence and the, the difference costs uh, was to calculate the overall sequence differences over three years. And then we used a clustering algorithm to identify if there were habitat use patterns of lake sturgeon across these nine detection segments. And here's an example on the y-axis, it's individual lake sturgeon. So uh, this is all 283 sturgeon just stacked on each other. And then this is sorted based on those similarity scores. And what stands out right away is even though there's some noise to it, you can see that there are patterns. It's just uh, readily apparent that there are distinct patterns. It's not 283 fish just bouncing all over the place all the time. And it's also more than just the Detroit and St. Clair River. We see more than two patterns here. And what we identified using the clustering algorithm were five groups within this system. So we had, <coughs> A middle Detroit River group, they were mostly in the middle Detroit River, which has some islands and habitat pockets that make sense to us that they would be there. We had a group that bounced back and forth 
between Lake St. Clair and the Detroit River. They seemed to spend the summer months in the Detroit River, and then they would move into Lake St. Clair for the winter months. The group with the most fish out of our, uh, out of our uh, study were Lake St. Clair residents. They spent almost all their time in Lake St. Clair, and then seasonally, some of them would go into the St. Clair River and a few into the Detroit River. Then we had another group that was primarily in Lake Huron, and then occasionally came down into the Huron Erie Corridor. And then we had a final group that lived in the St. Clair River Delta, which is a very, it's a, an area full of islands and shallow water habitat right before Lake St. Clair. This actually made a lot of sense to us as well that they would be uh, residing there. So we ended up with five groups. And what we could take from this was we started here with 283 fish bouncing all over the place. And it just looks like they're using the Huron Erie Corridor willy nilly. And what we've done with our tracking study is demonstrate that there's actually distinct patterns here. If you now look at these five boxes, yes, there's a lot of movement across the system as a whole, but we're also seeing that there are distinct repeat and, and long-term differences among these five groups. Another thing that jumps out to us that we are trying to put a lot of emphasis on from this research is the importance of Lake St. Clair. It seems to be the hub of activity for Lake Sturgeon in this area. So if Lake St. Clair stays healthy, productive habitat for Lake Sturgeon, we are likely to see all five of these behavioral groups be maintained. Uh, and this is this, so Lake St. Clair, which unfortunately often gets overlooked, we can actually say, no, we need to pay attention to this. And, and learn what the fish are doing in this habitat and how we can help conserve it for them. Another part of my work with lake sturgeon was to look at uh, adult survival uh, because lake sturgeon are very long lived, slow to reproduce animals. Female lake sturgeon tend to spawn only every five to six years, maybe even seven years. Uh, so they absolutely depend on high adult survival to get enough reproductive opportunities to uh, remain a viable population. Uh, it's been estimated that they need to have a survival in excess of 90 <clears throat> percent uh, each year in order to even have a chance at the population remaining self-sustaining. So we looked at seven years of acoustic detection records from 2012 to 2019 and use Cormac Jolly Seabird models to determine the probability of surviving and remaining in the system each of the years. We assumed emigration was zero in our case because we have good evidence that they're not moving away from the system. There are receivers for, for uh, fish throughout the Great Lakes. We're not picking up our Huron Erie corridor fish elsewhere. So we called this apparent survival if they were, they were not emigrating elsewhere. Then we have the probability of encountering individuals in a given year between one and zero. So this was just detection probability. Uh, how, how, high were, how likely were we to detect individuals in a given year? And then in the final year, because the way these models are structured in 2019, it's a joint probability of surviving and being detected. And that's just for the last year. Uh, and that's just a, a function of how the Cormac Jolly Seaver models are set up. So we generated encounter histories uh, on an annual basis, one meaning that, if that a surgeon was detected that year, and zero meaning that it wasn't detected. There was, there was no sightings of it. Uh, all individuals are detected in the year of tagging, which made sense considering that we tagged and then released animals right by a receiver. So we knew they were alive in that year. And we ended up with a total of 189 fish of known sex that were released, released in either the Detroit or St. Clair rivers. So we focused on those 189 fish. Of those 189 fish, 100 and 49 of them were detected every year after they were released. So that's 
80% fish of the fish right there that we could say, well, they were alive and detected every single year. But that's still below that roughly 90% threshold uh, needed for the population to be self-sustaining. So continuing on with the Cormac Jolly Seaver models, we looked at possible explanatory variables, including the release year, because we released fish in three years, the year itself from 2012 to 2019, the sex identified during tagging, where fish were released, whether it was the St. Clair Detroit rivers and length, which was a general proxy for age in our case. Uh, and we ran these models by doing a sequential model selection for each of the main parameters uh, in the model. Because of time right now, I'm not gonna run through each of them if you're interested. Um, uh, actually a paper on this was just released by the Journal of Great Lakes Research, or I'd be happy to go through it in the question period. But to just bring it after the model selection process, we ended up with a model that didn't include any of the explanatory variables for survival parameter. Uh, the detection probability, it included the year, so time, and then there was just lambda without any very explanatory variables. And when we ran this model and we show it for detection probability, what we saw was that it started out a little bit lower. At, in 2013, it was at about 87% and it rose to about 99% at the end of the study period. For the survival parameter, remember that time wasn't in effect here, so I'm showing the same one for each year. It was approximately 97% annual survival rate for adults. And then in the final year, which is survival and detection probability was estimated at 95%. So going back to the objectives of this part of the research, it was to estimate the survival of lake sturgeon tagged in the Huron Erie Corridor. And we found high apparent annual survival, 97%. So this is well within the level predicted to be necessary for a self-sustaining population. So this is really good news when it comes to sturgeon in the Huron Erie Corridor. We also want to determine if cohort uh, the sex, length, or release locations were related to survival. And we didn't find any of these variables were related to the survival. We did find that detection probability increased over time. But quite frankly, this actually made sense to us because from 2013 through 2015, 2016, there was a no noticeable increase in the number of receivers that were being set out in, in this area. So it just makes more, it just makes sense that if we put out more receivers, we are more likely to detect fish that are moving around. So this was actually consistent with the logistics of what was happening uh, in the system. So across these two studies that I, that I was fortunate enough to be part of with Lake Sturgeon and the Huron Erie Corridor, we found that long-term year-round monitoring was critical to identifying repeatable patterns of habitat used by these fish. We also found that there's behavioral diversity in, this po in these populations, and that this probably adds resistance and resiliency to changing environments. Uh, having diversity within the population is, is generally recognized as a good thing, and it, it's something that we should be supporting. One of the key things about the Huron Erie Corridor is the habitat connectivity. We don't have dams, weirs, other barriers to movement in these rivers and lakes. So we think, we argue that this connect connectivity was probably necessary to support the diversity of patterns observed. And finally, high adult survival was on par with natural mortality levels. So it's, and which is necessary for natural recruitment and population growth. Uh, if we had seen, if we had observed really high mortality, it, would, it could be an indicator of, of fishing pressure or some sort of un, unusual source of mortality that would have to be addressed before this population could remain viable long term. I'm going to shift gears now to talk about some of my most recent work with green sturgeon moving across the country over to the Sacramento River system. 
uh, where we've been looking at migration patterns of green sturgeon uh, in the Central Valley. So the Sacramento River runs through a region of California known as the Central Valley. It connects to the Pacific Ocean via a series of bays uh, through San Francisco. So starting at the Golden Gate Bridge, fish move into the system and up north through the Sacramento River. Uh, the, this air, the Sacramento River may be most famously known for the, the, the salmon species that migrate through it uh, and also salmon conservation efforts. But there are a number of native and invasive species that are now found in the Sacramento River. When it comes to green sturgeon, this is known as the southern population segment in the Sacramento River. It is an endangered species uh, act listed as threatened population. So it's a population of, of serious conservation concern. The conceptual model uh, for the river, the use of the Sacramento River by green sturgeon, it's definitely based on the best information that's been available from various forms of direct and indirect observations. And it basically says that green adult green sturgeon migrate up the river to the spawning grounds uh, in about March of each year. They'll spend a few months in the upper river and then migrate back down to the Pacific Ocean in around September or October. And the tracking techniques like acoustic telemetry provided the opportunity to collect long-term finer scale data from individual animals to see if this conceptual model holds true. So in the research that I've been working on with uh, Dan Ruman uh, and researchers from the University of Virginia and UC Davis is to look at the timing of up and down river migrations of green sturgeon in the Sacramento River. Uh, so we wanted to ask if green sturgeon migrate upriver during a relatively short period each spring, which was the prediction that they would move up in March or April of each year, and then ask if there are multiple downriver migrations. And even though the conceptual model that I just showed predicted that there wouldn't be multiple downriver migrations, there is a northern population of green sturgeon up in Washington and Oregon states. And in those areas, there are uh, multiple downriver migration groups. So we wanted to ask if the same thing was happening here. And so for this one, we did, uh, this is a data synthesis project. Um, UC Davis uh, hosts the BARD database that has uh, accumulated detection records for a number of species, <clears throat> including over 350 tagged green sturgeon in this database and 151 of those fish were in the Sacramento River from 2006 to 2018. So we pulled those records. We had uh, more than 300 receivers during that period that were deployed throughout the system. Not all simultaneously, but 300 total over those years. Um, and this covered from, run from right by the Golden Gate Bridge, even a few out in the Pacific, all the way up to right by the Keswick Dam, which is the barrier that, they're, that the, the sturgeon aren't gonna be able to move past. Uh, we considered upriver migrations beginning once fish left the inland delta. So that's the transition right over here from the um, black symbols up to the purple. And then on the way downriver from the, the holding and spawning ground, which are yellow in the upper river. Once they hit river kilometer 400, we considered that the beginning of the downriver migration. And this was based on the patterns we observed in the data that basically once a fish started to move down, once it hit river kilometer 400, it was pretty much a straight down trip and out of the system. And you'll see that in a second with some of the plots that I have. We ended up with 129 upriver migrations that were detected in the records and 224 downriver migrations. And the first thing I asked, I know when I started this project is why the difference? And the simple answer is that many of the fish were tagged in the Sacramento River partway up it. So while they were migrating. And if 
they're caught while they were migrating, we can't do an upriver timing for them. So with paired detection events where we had both the up and down, we had 117 full migration events in the, in the records. Here are some of the plots that uh, of the movements for six years. You can see it's when fish started moving up the river, then they come back down. And you can see that at about river kilometer 400, like I was saying before, after that point, when it's the downriver migration, they're really just shooting downriver and out of the system. The upriver migrations occurred from February to May of each year with the mean being in March. So that's exactly in line with the conceptual model. And we didn't see any sort of particular peak uh, or multiple peaks. There was just one main migration upriver. For downriver migrations, they occurred over a protracted period. They started as early as April and went as late as January. <clears throat> but the mean was October, mid-October. Again, that's what the conceptual model from CDFW said. <clears throat> but what we observed was two distinct pulses. There was an early group that left uh, in about June and a later group that left in December, January time period. So with these two pulses of activity, the early group left in June, the late group left in December, uh, the early group left at about 15 degrees Celsius versus 11 degrees. Uh, discharge was similar, but a little bit lower in the early group on average. And the early group of fish leaving represented about a third of the total events and two thirds were in this later group. So they were spending about two thirds of the green sturgeon spent several months in the Sacramento River before migrating back to the Pacific. And this made us question if there were discharge or temperature uh, variables related to when fish left the, left the river. Was there some sort of environmental cue helping with the decision of when to leave or not? And so for this, we used a time to event analysis. Um, in this case, we chose the Cox proportional hazard regression, and we looked at it separately for the early and late groups. So they were modeled completely independently of each other. And we looked at, um, we binned across five day intervals throughout the early or late periods to look at the mean discharge, the minimum discharge, mean temperature, and change in discharge or temp temperature between five day intervals as factors that could have, um, to ask if those factors were related to when fish began their movements downriver. These models produce a hazard ratio which indicates the relationship between the environmental covariate in this case and the likelihood of the event happening. So a hazard ratio of greater than one means that as the covariate, so for example, as river discharge increased, fish were more likely to, to begin their downriver migration. A uh, hazard ratio of less than one would mean that the likelihood of downriver migration decreased as the covariate increased. And we used model averaging across competing models to estimate an average effect for each covariate. And I'm just going to show one table here to show the results of that. Um, the take home message from this is that minimum discharge during the early out migration period was related to the likelihood of migration happening at higher minimum discharge values within those five day bins, fish were more likely to begin their migration. And similarly for the late out migration group, it was also a higher minimum discharge. They were more likely to begin their outriver migration. But um, so in addition to minimum rift, minimum river discharge, it was the only variable related to the probability of migration in both groups. Uh, and interestingly, temperature 
was not related to the probability of downriver migration in either group. So it really does seem to be river discharge that is probably the, it, the, probably the driving factor uh, in this population. Because of the lifespan of the tags that we had, we actually have observed multiple migrations for several fish. So actually 64 fish made multiple spawning migrations during our observation period. 56% of fish changed from the early to late period between the first and second migration. In this figure, that's the first two panels on the left. You can see that the upper panel early to late, that there, that's 56% of all the fish that were early their first migration switched to late for their second migration. In comparison, the two boxes on the right, which were fish that were late in their first migration that we observed, 20% changed from late in their uh, first migration to early in their second. So there was some movement between them. We did do a, a randomization test, and just because of timing, I'm not going to get into it today, but we do see a non-random association between the early and late groups. But we also think that combined across all of the results that we have, that it's possible that early migrants delay to the late period based on conditions during the summer months. And we think that the condition that they're tuning, that they're queuing into is probably river discharge rates. If it's June and the river is, the flow rates are too low, uh, it may be that they decide then to, we'll wait till the late period uh, and we'll summer up in the river before trying to swim down. So in summary, for the, this part of the research that I've been working on, conceptual models and telemetry observations, we agree on the spring upriver migrations, but we actually argue from the telemetry results that downriver migration times occur over two distinct pulses, uh, and that we should, we should change this conceptual model or consider changing it to, to uh, reflect that. This also raises further questions, though. What are the consequences of sturgeon spending long periods of time in the river system? What resources do they need? Are they at increased risk during this freshwater residency? Um, they're spending several months instead of several weeks up in the river. What does that mean in terms of foraging, uh, exposure to, to being caught by anglers? Uh, and also then the questions given the, the ongoing drought conditions in California, does this mean that we're pushing green sturgeon further and further into this late migration behavior? Uh, or is there some way that we can facilitate early migration through water management practices? Uh, and just to end off today, uh, going back across all of the work I've been fortunate enough to do on sturgeon, I want to draw some conclusions from both lake sturgeon and green sturgeon. There are a number of conservation challenges for sturgeon. That's, that's undoubted. But many of them are the result of not knowing the ecology, the basic ecology of different sturgeon species. And I think that researchers and managers around the world are doing a great job at trying to pick this up now and figure out just the basic fundamental ecology of these species and then turn that into management action. Sturgeon exhibit diverse behaviors. So in the lake sturgeon, I showed five different behaviors within the Huron Erie corridor. This may relate to something like the portfolio effect that we often hear about now in ecology. Um, it's likely important to the sustainability of, the, of wild populations and not just for sturgeon. I realize that this is a cross species and this is just an example of it. Um, fish, fish passage and connections bet between marine and freshwater ecosystems are more important than we historically perceived. This is becoming widely recognized. I don't know if there's a week goes by in the past couple of years where I haven't seen a paper or an article arguing about fish, fish passage and uh, establishing connections uh, again. Uh, and so the, the sturgeon are just a great example of that. 
Uh, water flow and other environmental cues are important for, to helping wild populations persist in natural ecosystems. We need to understand the cues that these animals are using to interact with their environment if we're going to be able to help facilitate natural movements. So do, with green sturgeon in the Sacramento River, do we need to encourage water management to have a period where they increase flow for a few weeks so that it, uh, in, it encourages more of the green sturgeon to leave the system, um, especially if that would have long-term uh, positive benefits for them. This requires more work, but we're on the track to it now. And most importantly, I think that it's that we are learning about sturgeon and their ecology. And even though they are in pressing population concerns, there is still time to help these animals. And so I, I like to try and leave on a pos positive message, which is in this case, we still can do a lot of good for these animals and see to it that the 250 million year history of surgeon isn't coming to an end, that it's just still going along and we can do something about it. I've been very fortunate in both projects, Lake Sturgeon and Green Sturgeon, to work with a variety of people and organizations that have been uh, a great benefit to me uh, and to this research. And so I really thank them and all of their help. And I thank you all for taking some time out of your Friday to listen to me talk about sturgeon for a little bit. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, and there's also contact information if, in case you wanna catch up with me later as well.